do 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 uh, so you can take a class that's going you're gonna have to take later on at a much lesser price. So you can go ahead and get it out of the way. All right, things that are going on around you up at the uh, campus. If you got brothers or sisters, uh, or even just yourself and your friends, they're having that Halloween uh, family safe trick or treat up at the McKinney campus and conference center you might want to take advantage of. Uh, this leadership camp thing, guys, uh, some of the students are actually told me they're considering doing it. Um, that would look great on like college apps or if you wanted to have like a job up at your campus. So I would really, really, really consider doing that. Uh, Halloween contest, Monday at noon. Uh, beat the Provost up at the Plano Kansas Atrium on Tuesday. Uh, can't do that because time, can't do that because time. Talent show, distracted driver education from 11 to 1 on Tuesday, November 8th. Got spades, uh, Thanksgiving feasts. Uh, I have no idea where the, oh, that's up in the campus. Anyway, uh, you can have the Thanksgiving meal up there. Intramurals, if you're uh, 17 and up. Uh, ba -ba -ba, new student, y'all don't need that. Uh, table hawking, don't, can't do it because of time. World Cup watching party, the USA versus Wales. That, well, won't have time to do that. Might catch a little bit of it. Uh, intramurals dominoes, uh, if you're 17 up, but looks like time won't allow that. Mechanical bull riding, uh, if you're over 17 or 17 and up. That's going to be in the Plano Campus Atrium. That would probably be fun. Ah! Uh, pancakes and PJs on Tuesday, the 29th of November, in the Plano Campus Art Atrium from 12.30 to 2.30. Probably couldn't make it, but it's, if you could, it's there. Uh, Intramurals Dodgeball Tournament. Uh, the Escape Room. Woo! But y'all don't have time to do that. Virtual 5K. And there we go. So good, good for you. Good for you. All right, do we get to this or not? Too loud. Did we get to this? Yes, no, maybe so. This one right here? Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, we landed like 450 Marines. We uh, got allies. Am I recording? Because I'm fantastic. Yeah. Red. Yeah, yeah, red button. Don't look at me. Focus on that. There you go. All right. So um, where did I get to in this? Did I get through the Philadelphia? Stephen Decatur and basically going to blow up our own ship. Did I get through that? Huh? No? Okay, so anyway, Thomas Jefferson is first American president to dispatch American troops to foreign soil uh, to go along the Barbary Coast, basically most of North Africa is Barbary Coast. This part of the, Egypt is part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, one of the ships, the Philadelphia, was chasing uh, a Barbary a pirate vessel, and it almost caught it, but then bam, it ran aground, and, which meant that it hit the bottom of the ocean where they were, and it couldn't unstick itself even after they dumped off all the cannons and all that stuff. Well, uh, they said, you know, we'll come back and get it the next day. That night, a storm happened, blew the Philadelphia off, lifted it off the uh, coast, I mean the bottom, and the Barbary pirates were like, hey, free ship. So they went, they took it, put all the cannons back on it, took it and brought it to the coast of Tripoli, and they had our ship. And we were like, that is not going to happen. Guys, our Navy does not like to have 
our, ves our vessel is captured in a foreign port. So, a young buck, 24 years old, by the name of Stephen Decatur, he gets together with a crew of about 20 other guys, and there's no way with these big ships that they could climb aboard it and sneak it out of the harbor, but they were like, hey, we gotta destroy the thing. So they collected all this gunpowder and then put all these, um, like, uh, woolen blankets and stuff that had been soaked in paraffin, like candles, and basically light it to create a long fuse. Uh, they light it. By this time, the beach guard, the beach patrols see what's going on. They're shooting at the guys. Um, they're trying to escape in this little captured Barbary pirate vessel that they had used to sneak in. They cut the last rope because that was the only thing that was connecting it to them. They drift away and all of a sudden Philadelphia explodes, depriving the Barbary pirates of one of our uh, ships of the line. And indeed, in American history today, there is only one U.S. naval vessel that is in enemy hands. And we probably won't be getting this one back. It's in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Basically, it's like a, it's like a glorified fishing boat. It was an electronic surveillance boat. I, think it, I don't even know the name of it. I think it's the Pueblo, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, uh, we were outside of their waters. At least that's what our story is. They say we were inside of their waters. That's what their story is. Their ships are charging towards them. Uh, the captain of the vessel hits the self-destruct button, which didn't work. And so basically the North Korean Navy was able to capture it. They get it transported to the capital of North Korea, where currently it serves as a museum uh, against North American imperial uh, warmongering. Anyway, so the Marines, basically 450 of them, uh, together with Arab allies, start going on a coordinated effort with the Navy and taking over coastal towns they get all the way to Tripoli. They basically force the Bey, who's kind of like their sultan, to surrender and promise never to attack American ships again. And so we're all like, yeah, we're number one. We're number one. And then we get back to America and we tell them, look, we did this great victory. We forced them to surrender. And they're like, oh, didn't anybody tell you? We paid them some money and then we signed a peace treaty with them. They swore they'd never attack us again. So military victory, diplomatic victory, either way, it's done. So how do inmates talk to each other? How do inmates communicate? Anyone? Cell phones, you kid, you. Did you hear that my son was eating through electrical cords, chewing on them? Well, he's grounded. And currently, he's okay, but he's conducting himself properly. See what I did to you kids? Okay, now we've got a crisis in America's interior. Basically, Napoleon was on the rise in France, and he takes over Spain. He puts his brother in as the new king of Spain, and basically his brother because he's the king of Spain, gives back to Napoleon all of the land west of the Mississippi River that after the American Revolution, France had to give to Spain. Well, uh, so France gets control and possession of all that land, including New Orleans, which is the mouth of the Mississippi River. And we are totally freaked out that they are going to shut off the, the uh, Mississippi River to Americans, okay? Because, I mean, that thing is like a lifeline to all of the immigrants that are flooding into uh, Kentucky, the Ohio River Valley, okay? I mean, that would be incredibly detrimental because that, like I said, is the main highway. Well, kind of further amping up concerns about this is what happened down in the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo that basically the slaves revolted underneath Toisson de Vatour, who was kind of like a house slave. He, was, uh, he knew how to read, very well educated. 
He was a mulatto. He had heard about the revolution in France, you know, fraternité, uh, equalité, uh, and he thought, hey, that applies to us too. So he leads a slave revolt in 1791 against their former masters. Now, Poisson, however, was so wise of a leader that he said, look, don't kill your former masters. Don't kill the mayors, don't kill the plantation owners. Don't, if you can be avoided. Now, why do you think that was so, well, first off, I'll ask this. Before you start questioning, why would he keep those guys alive? I mean, those were their former tormentors. Guys, if we had a revolution or whatever here in America, why would you probably not want to kill your car mechanic? Because he knows how to fix your car. You don't. Okay? Guys, Poisson was like, these guys know how to run a plantation. These guys know how to get the sap to sugar effectively. You know, these guys know how to run a city. They know how to collect taxes. They know how to repair streets. Don't, and not only that, but guys, that looks great in the eyes of the world. Well, uh, so him and his black Jacobians win. In 1791, needless to say, America was one of the first countries that recognized the Dominican Republic. Well, only this scared a lot of the guys in the South. And it actually kind of gave hope to some of the slaves in the South. One of the slaves is Gabriel. That was up in Virginia. And Gabriel was a skilled blacksmith. I mean, this guy was such a good, talented blacksmith that his owner let Gabriel go ahead and hire himself out to nearby plantations and stuff like that to anybody who needed blacksmith work. Now, see, that's the way that some slaves basically were able to acquire the capital to purchase their own freedom, okay? Um, and his master did that. Well, Gabriel was caught stealing a pig by his overseer. And his overseer came to punish him, and Gabriel was so fed up with it that he just leapt up, grabbed his overseer's head, and bit off his ear. Well, that's not nice. So he gets caught, he gets put on trial, he gets flogged, whipped, and he gets put in jail for a month. But for Gabriel, that's cool. He knows about what happened in the Dominican Republic. So he starts getting to, and I told you, he was a very skilled blacksmith. So they start taking like old scythes and making swords out of them and molding their own bullets. He got to get, he had a whole network because he was going to start this slave revolt in just more than little Richmond, okay? There was more than 65 people that were all supposed to rise up on one night. Well, actually, there was more than 65. 65 were the ones that got the blame for everything, um, that were going to have this huge slave revolt on this one night. I believe it was August 30th. Only problem is, it was raining like a son of a gun that night. So, they go ahead and they say, well, we're going to postpone it. Well, when they gave it more time, that is more time for the plan to be discovered. Somebody found out about the plan. Then they start cajoling the slaves, saying, hey, you know, if, if you provide states, if you provide evidence against these other guys, we won't, we're not going to press any crimes against you. And so people turned against people. I mean, the whole thing started to collapse. And basically, Gabriel uh, and 29 others were found guilty at the end, and they were all executed. Um, but over here, and... Meanwhile, in, uh, in France, this is one of their sugar islands. And France wanted that sugar island back. And so at first they were acting all cool to Toisson, and Napoleon was like, hey, send your kids over here to France. We're going to give them an education. It's going to be all great. And Toisson was like, oh, cool. So he lets them have his sons. And he's like, okay, I want to see my sons. It's been two years. You know, send them back. Oh, no, no, no. They're still in school. Don't worry. They're still in school. Basically, he was holding the kids hostage. And by 1802, he sent an army of 35,000 uh, 
train French soldiers over to retake uh, the Dominican Republic for France. Well, guys, freed men, remember, these are guys that remember what slavery was. They're not going to put up with it. So they put up a fight. Uh, more than 100,000 of the newly freed men died. But uh, due to their counterattack, as well as like yellow fever, malaria, and other tropical diseases, basically decimates the French army and the Dominican Republic remains a free country, free of France. Um, but before we knew that would happen, because this was like a 13 year battle, uh, a, a lot of people here in America were scared that basically Napoleon wanted to create a new world empire with the Caribbean being its heart. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson was so scared about it that he feared that he might have to make an alliance with the British. Ready for the next slide? He decides to try to beat the system by sending Monroe and Livingston over to Paris with two million dollars just to buy the city of New Orleans. Now once again, what was so important about the city of New Orleans? Where was it on the Mississippi? Yeah, it's at the mouth. Guys, you control the mouth of the river, you control the river. So he gets these guys, got two million, and they just got two million dollars and we just want uh, New Orleans. Well, when we get over there, however, Guys, this would be like me with 20 bucks going up to Best Buy to buy a DVD of Mad Max Fury Road. Because all I've got is 20 bucks. Okay? And I'm going just to get this DVD. Well, they get over there. They meet with the French Foreign Minister, Talleyrand, and there's been a huge shift in plans for France. Uh, basically, England is building up their armies. They desperately need more money. That whole thing in the Dominican Republic didn't go like they thought it would. So they need money. And they say, tell you what, instead of just New Orleans for two million bucks, we'll sell you all the land for 15 million. What? That would be like if I went to Best Buy and said, okay, I want that DVD of Mad Max. And the guy on the floor said, hey, I'll tell you what, instead of just selling you that DVD, uh, I'll sell you that uh, HD 42 uh, screen plasma, uh, surround sound, speakers, everything like that. I'll sell that to you for 150 bucks. What? And needless to say, I love this song, but it's not going to play. Needless to say, we freaked out and we were going to take it. Now, why was it so important that we take the Louisiana Purchase? Well, guys, for just $15 million, look at all it gave us. It saved us from having to make a foreign entanglement of an alliance with Britain. It secured the Mississippi River in perpetuity for the United States. It more than doubled our size. Look at all that land. Okay, we didn't really know what it, precisely its borders were, but guys, we more than doubled our size. Uh, it eliminated one foreign threat from the continental 48 United States. You know, France has gone away. You know, they might have their Indian agents out, you know. But Spain's still there. Russia's still there. England's north of us. But we don't have to worry about France anymore. And it gives all this new land an opportunity for farmers. Y'all remember Jefferson loved farmers. So for him, this was a win-win. <clears throat> well, I don't know if any of y'all are interested, but I think, have I, anybody want to see Black Adam? Mm -hmm. Anyway, they're showing it up at the Alamo Draft House, Richardson. Mm -hmm. Ready for the next slide? So Jefferson is like, yes, take it. The only problem with this, um, guys, the president can't buy land. That's not one of his powers. It's supposed to be Congress. Only problem is 
Congress isn't in session right now. And this is one of those deals that if you get an offer like this, you take it, baby. And by the way, guys, when Congress did reconvene, which was in November of 1803, they, they quickly ratified. I mean, about the only people that are against it are the Federalists from the Northeast. They're like, eh, you pay too much money. Eh. Now, as you can guess, even before Congress had ratified it, though, Jefferson had sent a secret expedition to explore the area. You had Lewis and Clark. Meriwether Lewis was Jefferson's private secretary. William Clark was the son of George Rogers Clark. They were given false papers saying they were on a scientific uh, mission. And you know, they did bring back scientific, uh, scientific, scientific examples like of groundhogs, which Thomas Jefferson actually thought were the coolest things in the world. They brought back samples of like antlers, like look at how big the spread of the American antlers are. Uh, and the wing spread of the hawks and the eagles, how, how much larger they were than their European counterparts. As if the very freedoms and democracy that made America great was embodied in the... Wow, that was fun for the time. Now, basically, what they were supposed to do was look and see, hey, are there any rivers that go all the way to the Pacific Ocean, maybe? Uh, where are the Indian tribes we can trade with? What are the foreign agents that are there? Like the French, like the British, like the Russians, okay? Like the Spanish. And uh, Indians were crucial to the success of this expedition. Okay, you had like uh, Sacagawea, who was actually born west of the Rocky Mountains, like on the Pacific Coast. But through her life, travels, and marriages, she basically was now on the eastern side of the Rockies. But she knew how to speak all the Indian languages on the way they were going to go. She also knew how to speak French. And her husband, Charbonneau, knew how to speak. He was French, and he also knew how to speak English. So every time they wanted to ask a new Native American they met a question, it was like a big game of telephone. I or Lewis and Clark would ask Charbono. Charbono would then ask Sacagawea. Sacagawea would then translate it into the Native American language. You'd give her the answer. You'd translate that to French. You'd then translate that to English. And then, oh, okay, for every single... But they knew how to do it, and they were communicating. And it effectively got us all the way out to these. And, of course, they had these little friendship medals that had Thomas Jefferson's picture on it that they would give to the Native Americans they met. And you know what is so cool? Even though I'm part Cherokee, like I've met, I've met the national chief, which is their president, of uh, the Cherokee Nation like three times. And each time I meet him, guess what he does? He gives me one of those peace medals with his little image down on the front with the peace symbol in the back. So that's going on on, okay, so this is Lewis and Clark right here. Oh, and you want to hear the real sad part of the story? Guess what happened to Meriwether Lewis a few years after a successful completion of the Lewis and Clark expedition, where he saw this amazing, wondrous stuff. Guess what he does? Kills himself. Anyway, sad. Uh, meanwhile, there was a guy, and this was the highest ranking guy in the U.S. Army. His name was General James Wilkinson. Now this guy, everybody thought, oh my gosh, he's the military man. He's so cool. Well, he was selling military, he was a double agent. He was selling secrets to the English, he was selling secrets to the Spanish, 
He'd sell secrets to anybody to help himself out. Okay, meanwhile, he was turning around and telling the U.S. information on these other countries. He was, basically, he wanted to pull out his own empire in the West and steal it away from Spain, steal parts away from America, and have his own little republic out there. He sent Zebulon Pike. Now, Zebulon Pike didn't know any of this. He said, I just want you to explore the southernmost boundaries of the Louisiana Purchase. So he goes out and he explores. Uh, he discovers, or they name Pike's Peak after him. Uh, he continues down. He goes into Santa Fe, and he sees the incredible possibilities for trade there. Uh, but soon he's captured by the Spanish, saying, oh, what are you doing here? No, I don't think so. He's taken all the way down to Mexico City, and he's held there for like two years, and then finally the Viceroy says, just let the guy go, and he makes his way back up to the United States. But he talked about the promise, the hope and promise for trade uh, with the Spanish territory out there. Ready for the next slide? Challenge and uncertainty in Jefferson's America. <clears throat> All right. What happens every four years? Election, baby! And guys, as you can tell, the, by the election of 1804, the Federalists found themselves in an incredibly weak position. I mean, Jefferson's policies and achievements had made the Republican Democrats exceedingly popular. I mean, what had been a close election in 1800, by 1802, his popularity had caused a sweep of Republican Democrat power in the legislature, and immense popularity in 1804. I mean, how are you going to attack the guy? About the only thing the Federalists could use? Yeah. He spent too much money on that land, and it wasn't in his power to do that anyway. Hmm, poo. And here you see an editorial cartoon they had against Jefferson. Here's a, Thomas Jefferson as a groundhog. Here's a French minister showing Louisiana Purchase. Napoleon is a wasp that's stinging him, and Jefferson's just throwing up money, uh, throwing it up. I'll pay anything. Now, guys, was Jefferson kind of worried about that? No. I mean, look at his successes. He had totally eliminated internal taxes. He encouraged westward migration. He eliminated the Alien and Sedition Acts. He gave hope. Guys, you're not going to be stuck in a factory in Pennsylvania. You got land. You can be your own person. You can go out there and make a fortune. The world is open to you. Go and get it. That's all you have to do. Uh, oh, and by the way, even though he didn't do anything to support industry and econ uh, the economy, it was booming. You had people that were collect amassing fortunes in those areas without government help. So people giving them taxes or tax breaks. And he was able to create a multi-million dollar surplus for the treasury. Just by cutting spending. Now you know what the fun thing about my camera is, is that I have to shut it off before it reaches 30 minutes or it will shut itself off. And then I can restart it. Because otherwise it's, there's too much information, I can't take any more of it. And I say, okay, can we be friends? Yeah, we be friends. Ready for the next one? What? Can go back? No. no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure it focuses on the important stuff, not on me. Did I tell you the difference between Iron Man and Aluminum Man? Iron Man smashes his opponents, whereas Aluminum Man foils their attempts. Are we ready? Everybody? Come on, come on. 
I'm sure we'll have a lot of things. Are you Robin? No, her writing. Who? Her, she's writing on the screen. Are you ready? Okay. I thought you may have been writing notes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have the West. Guys, the West is trying to attract settlers, which is causing a lot of anxieties. Eastern businessmen hate it, okay? For example, let's say you're a restaurant owner. You're selling meals to everybody in this room, right? Now all of a sudden, all these people are gone. So you're only going to be making money selling to them. Not only that, but she was your cook. He was your waiter. Now you're going to have to go hire a new cook and a new waiter, and because there's less people, they can demand higher wages. So you're making less money coming in the door. You're having to spend more money keeping. You don't like it at all. All these. I used to have a good life. What the hey? Meanwhile, people out the West that are living. Guys, if you want to be a Western city, you basically have to keep yourselves vital because all these people are coming in. You come in on one day, and guess what happens the next day? You're gone. Because you have no intention to stay in my town. What you want to do is go out west. You want to go hit your land. So I have to attract you guys to come to my city and make sure you get out safely. Meanwhile, i got to keep peaceful terms with the Native Americans that are living nearby. And some of you guys might be Yahoos and trying to take their land. So it's tough. That's kind of like, guys, one of the best cities to live in in Texas is San Antonio because the taxes are almost nothing. Do you know why the taxes are almost nothing in San Antonio? Because they are the number one tourist attraction. Not, and guys, they're attracting people not only from Texas to go there, but also from Mexico, also from other countries. And guys, if you're doing that, you have to spend money to make sure that you keep your city a place that visitors want to come and be tourists to. So like the year I left San Antonio, they had just passed a $14 million bond to expand the Riverwalk eight miles to basically create more places to set up more attractions for tourists. And so far, guys, it's paying off quite well. Now, what are some problems about the West? Well, cheap economical transportation simply was not possible. I mean, the Mississippi River was the main highway down, but its current made it so uh, unprofitable to take barges back up the river that they'd get down to New Orleans, then they'd tear down the barges, sell them for firewood, and take the uh, Natchez Trail back up. And the Natchez Trail was basically Indian trails and Native American footpaths that ran parallel to the Mississippi River. In the Northeast, uh, they had the same problem. For those who wanted to take the St. Lawrence Seaway, yeah, sure. But maybe that's what you were doing when you left earlier for class. Um, and also, a deal about Canada was that on the other side, in England was there, which might potentially be an enemy. And the ebb and flow in settlement uh, basically uh, led to economic unpredictability. In other words, you had to continue to attract people, otherwise your city was going to die. Like today, the capital of Missouri is Jefferson City, but before that it was, no, way, way early on, about the 1920s, it was St. Joseph's. And then that was then it moved to another one that was just another frontier town. And it wasn't until I believe the 1850s that it finally was Jefferson City. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, oh, well, this is creating a lot of social instabilities. The Western communities that are being built up, like St. Joe's, like Jeff City, like St. Louis, guys, you have tons, usually the people that are going out there are men. They might call for their wives and children later on, 
or if their wives or children with them. It doesn't matter. If you're a guy, first thing on your priority deal is getting your farm started. If you need a general store, hey, you're going to build it where it seems to make place. Uh, you'll build it by the city hall. Doesn't have to make sense. Doesn't have to be patterns. Okay, I'm not concerned. We'll build a church, a bar, tavern. We'll build, you know, a general. And guys, they're very disorganized, not orderly at all. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, young adults, these are the kids that had been um, born in the baby boom that followed the Revolutionary War. Basically, they're reaching independence at a much earlier age. Because they can tell mom and dad, hey, mom, dad, meet Gwen. Uh, we're getting married. You're not asking our permission, son? No, I'm not. Oh, and by the way, we're going to move hundreds of miles away. You might never see us in your life again. <gasps> My baby! But they can do it and get away with it. And the guys, that scares the hooies out of a lot of parents. Now, how many of you guys out there are uh, the oldest sibling or firstborn? If you think your parents are crazy now, just wait till next year. Because what's going to happen after your senior year in high school? For most of you. College. Yeah, college. You're not going to be here anymore. That's their last year they can... And guys, your mother is going to bawl her eyes out when she's taking her little baby girl to college. And she loves you. And then... Meanwhile, I'm the second born kid. Yeah. You got your car parked? All right, see you later. Have fun, Andy. Have a good time at UT. But that first... Oh, 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 oh. Do you have any middle children here? Raise your hand if you're a middle child. Did you know that yesterday was National Middle Child's Day? Yeah, don't even care. Nobody knows. Anyway. I care. I called my brothers. Are, are you the youngest? Or? I'm the middle child. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> now, how does religion respond to the social change. Well, in the Northeast, uh, you remember they kind of gone away from being Puritans, and so now they start drifting for rationalism or Unitarianism that is much more deist. It uh, stresses individual freedom of belief, kind of rejects the Trinity, Kind of, you know, takes a, guys, miracles didn't really happen. I mean, like Thomas, these guys are deists. Thomas Jefferson uh, wrote his own version of the Bible, uh, except any time it said God, he replaced it with nature. In the beginning was nature, and nature was good, you know. Because, I mean, that's kind of like where their lives are going now. They're going into commerce and industry, so they're having to schedule, make appointments, everything like that. So this whole deal about a God that is personal to you, that you can see that has his own messages for you, makes sense. Indeed, um, they were able to take control of uh, Harvard, and they threw out predestination, and many of the young people in the East liked the spiritual empowerment. Ready for the next slide? Meanwhile, you have a whole evangelical movement burning through the South and West. It all started out at Cane Ridge, Kentucky, where 20 to 30,000 people of all ages, you know, varying cultures, all got together there. And, you know, it was a huge revival movement. Lasting about a week, you know, the mornings would be filled with conversations with others and prayers, then the nights would be filled with fiery preaching. And what were they preaching? Basically, it was reinstating God's vision for America. We were to be a light into the world. We were supposed to spread the gospel. Guys, what were they doing in the South and West? They were spreading out. So it's like what they were doing was reflective of God's will and vision. Ready for the next one? Ready? Mm, yeah. Well, what about non-whites in Jefferson's Republic? Well, um, Thomas Jefferson, for everything fantastic, 
I've said, and he, by the way, was very progressive for his time and his thoughts on African Americans, but at the end of the day, he believed that whites were superior to blacks. He believed that uh, African Americans were inferior to whites in the endowments of body and mind. This is despite the achievements of Benjamin Banneker, a celebrated mathematician, engineer, and surveyor, who many claim uh, helped lay out the city plan for Washington, D.C. He stated to Banneker, nobody wishes more than I do to see such proofs as you exhibit that nature is given to our black brethren, talents equal to those of other colors of men. However, he believed that his excellence was evidence of Banneker's moral eminence rather than his intellectual equality. And Monticello finally has kind of because uh, Thomas Jefferson did carry on an affair with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. That, for the longest, Monticello denied. However, DNA proves that the offspring of uh, Sally Hemings had to have come either from Thomas Jefferson or his brother. And there are a lot more accounts of Sally being with Thomas that even had a special bedroom built off of his bedroom. Now, meanwhile, despite that, um, or despite the emancipation in the North, they were systematically excluded from white society. In response to that, you have the development of African Methodist Episcopal churches, like Richard Allen formed the Bethel Church for Negro Methodists in 1793, and two years later he became the first black deacon ordained in America. He formed his own African Methodist Episcopalian branch in 1816, and within two decades their numbers grew to over 12,000. joining together with other African American denominations like the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and others to provide a variety of services, schools. They launched the first African American magazine in America and even its first college, Wilbur Forge University. Oh, and by the way, I just did I tell you guys that you need to join the student clubs up at um, Colin? Because they got, I mean, if you want to join them, they got the Baptist Student Association, I think they got an FCA, they got the Muslim Student Association, they got all these different groups, they got robotics, anime, uh, there's one that watches films. Anyway, the reason why, I mean, not only should you do it for friendship and camaraderie and everything that'll help you, because like there's probably going to be one of these clubs where you decide to go, but if you join this year, guess what they're going to be doing uh, next year? They're going to be holding elections for offices, and you could be, you could be like a liaison. You might see if you could have an office of being a liaison between dual credit uh, students in that organization, or you might even become like the secretary or treasurer of that organization. And once again, like if you go to uh, UTD, UTD had the very first Muslim Students Association in the United States of America. So that is a club that has a huge clout, okay? And these other clubs, when you get to other universities, they're going to be pretty, they're going to have a lot of contacts. And so guys, definitely, see, if, go, just go up and see if there's a club that you'd be interested in joining. Because it might help you out getting more contacts for the future. All right, Native Americans, basically, uh, services were established to transmit white culture to them. This is the, um, they were supposed to be treated as children that didn't know how to use their rights. Because Thomas Jefferson believed they were our equals, 
But until they learned to be like us, they had to be treated as kids. And sadly, the best way to make sure that they had time to grow, to learn to be like us, it would be best if they were on the other side of the Mississippi River. Huh? Hey. Now this all is despite, can I go to the next one? This all is despite the advances of some of these Native American groups. And guys, we're so close to finishing this, I can almost taste it, but we're out of time. So you're going to have to watch the video. That'll put, because like, I think there's only like two more slides of.